Welcome, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome Yale University professor uh, Jason Stanley, the Jacob Erwitz Professor of Philosophy at Yale, uh, and the author of the acclaimed book, How Fascism Works, uh, The Politics of Us and Them. Um, this is Jason Stanley's fifth book, I think, is that right? Uh, following on the heels of most recently, Know How? And how Propaganda Works. And mm -hmm. How Propaganda Works in 2015, and before that, Know How in 2011. And so we're delighted to welcome you back to Columbia. We had you here, we we're fortunate to have you here for Praxis 13 for our conversation about uh, the new right. Um, and that was a very rich discussion, and it was really during that conversation and those interactions in relationship to discussions of the right in America and in Europe that, um, that I realized that we needed to continue the conversation. Um, in part, we needed to continue the conversation and specifically to talk about the relationship between fascism and your work on fascism and, uh, and what I call the counter-revolution, which is for me a central kind of preoccupying uh, concern. Um, I mean, when, my, when my book, uh, The Counter-Revolution, went to press back in uh, the fall of 2017 to come out in 2018, I really wasn't sure what variation of uh, counter-revolution we would have under Trump. Um, the, the argument of the book was that we've had different flavors of counter-revolution since 9-11, that we had a, originally with George Bush, we had a kind of a very brutal flavor uh, counter-revolution that was tied to, to torture and indefinite detention. And then after that we had a different flavor, but it was a continuation of this way of governing through counterinsurgency paradigms. And it was the Obama variation which privileged drone strikes and, um, and global total information awareness. And of course when Trump was on the campaign it was clear that he was going to offer some different kind of variation. And it was clear that he was talking about, you know, even more brutal uh, use of waterboarding, uh, even worse torture. Um, he was talking about filling Guantanamo again, uh, this time even with American citizens uh, who had been captured abroad. And so there was a sense in which he was going to kind of up the ante, um, but it wasn't clear what the flavor of this new way of governing was going to be. Um, and of course, when he took power, he immediately signed the Muslim ban, which was uh, a classic form of counterinsurgency method of kind of creating an internal enemy, uh, an internal enemy made up of all Muslims, Muslim Americans, I mean, demonizing Muslim Americans and whatnot. Um, but it was only kind of a few months later, really, uh, after the book came out and when I started reading your book and we were having discussions about fascism, that it started to dawn on me that actually the style of counter-revolutionists that, that Trump has put into place feels like uh, a, a neo-fascist, white supremacist, kind of ultra-nationalist uh, counter-revolution. Uh, and so that's why, uh, from my perspective, I really thought it would be important to continue the conversation and to, and to learn more about uh, the way you see things today, uh, and of course, from my perspective, how they relate to uh, this idea of the counter-revolution. Now, um, uh, uh, I, I wanted to start really by maybe asking a clarificatory question of you, on your work. Um, because, and it has to do with where we are exactly today in America, uh, uh, somewhere between um, the logics being used, the logic of fascism being used, which you describe so well in your book, and the reality of being in something that could be described in some way as having elements of or being fascist. Now, um, you intricately uh, detail in this book, uh, the logic. You speak of an ideology, you speak of justifications, you speak of making people believe things, you speak of casting uh, in certain ways 
Uh, and so you talk about a linguistic tactic and also political slogans. And of course, you, um, and for those of you who have the book in front of you or want to grab a copy, there are some extra copies right, right in the next room, you kind of summarize this beautifully, pages 16, 17 from your introduction, where you talk about the different elements that make up this logic and rhetoric of fascism. Uh, you talk about the, you write about the most telling symptom of fascist politics being division, right, which aims to separate a population into an us and a them. Um, and you uh, talk about the fact that fascist politicians justify their ideas by breaking down a common sense of history and creating a mythic past to support their vision of the present. Uh, you rewrite the population's shared understanding of reality by twisting the language of ideals through propaganda and promoting anti-intellectualism attacking universities and educational systems that might challenge their ideas. Uh, eventually, these uh, techniques, uh, through these techniques, fascist politics creates a, a state of unreality. And you also talk about the, the creation of, and support of, of hierarchy, of human worth, uh, feelings of victimhood, this notion of law and order, uh, which you trace in various chapters, notions of sexual anxiety that are also typical of fascist politics. Now, of course, all of that is in the register of um, uh, ways of speaking, um, ways of constructing the political sphere. And, you're, you're, and there are times when it almost slides into a description of fascism today. And you recognize, for instance, on page 19, that fascism today may not look exactly as it did in the 1930s, which is kind of a possible suggestion that what we're dealing with are not just logics and rhetoric, but actually a different kind of uh, fascism, or somewhere close to, close to a different kind of fascism. You're careful to say, of course, uh, that um, uh, you're, not, you're not saying that fascism is upon us. You say that on page 191, so you're clear to say, you know, it's not that we've got, you know, 1930s fascism today. But I'm trying to figure out kind of where would you draw the line exactly as to where we are between uh, uh, the, the use of the same rhetoric, mm -hmm. right, which you spell out so beautifully in all of the chapters here, and a fascist state. Okay, good. So I would also say that, you know, we're not anywhere near or never have been close to democracy. And so you could ask the same question about democracy. So, um, so you know, there's a directionality. We might be going in different directions at different points. But um, so uh, one thing that, uh, I mean, there are a lot of strong overlaps in, in my book, in our, in our books. Uh, but one thing we're both doing is we're tracing uh, clearly fascist oppressive fascist tactics uh, in some directed at some communities so a lot of my book is directed uh, uses uh, American anti-black racism and mass incarceration as a core example of, of practices that are clearly incredibly dehumanizing uh, you know uh, formation of out create the formation of out groups in very similar ways to to what you saw with classic fascist um, uh, class classics or Nazi anti-Semitism, for instance. Um, so I think, and whereas, and what you're doing is you're doing it with colonialism. You're saying like, look, uh, look at these practices, uh, that, you know, torture, these ways of completely, uh, you know, dehumanizing. Uh, that word is like almost um, has been. Dehumanized. It, it, it doesn't have the cloud it should anymore. Um, but you're focusing on the war on the war on terror, um, the use of these tactics in uh, in uh, to undergird um, warfare, uh, which don't treat the enemy combatant as an e equal, but treat them as some horrific, you know, uh, person who deserve, deserve not even a person who deserves this this uh, the, you know not subject to the Geneva Conventions and. Um, whereas, and I, what, I, what I'm doing in my book is focusing on the U.S. mass incarcer U.S. mass incarceration, and uh, and in both cases, what you have is you have 
germs that you can then use to generalize that. So when, when Mr. Trump ran for office, he said, you know, we're not good. Look at what we did in Iraq. Like, you have, what you have, what you have in sort of, you know, the standard, when you have sort of liberal, ordinary, when you have people thinking of themselves as in a liberal democratic state but making exceptions, <laughs> then, uh, then they talk one way. And what Trump did is he's like, let's stop pretending. You know, but you have that. that uh, so what? What our practice of mass incarceration was a clearly like the 1990s when violent crime is going down and incarceration rates are shooting up, and you have this horrific rhetoric happening uh, directed against our mostly our black population. Um, you had, uh, you know, you could just see. Well, you could just use that rhetoric, broaden it to immigrants, broaden it to political opponents, you know, and, and you see this in the history of discussions of fascism, like Du Bois's The World in Africa, where he talks, where he begins and says, uh, or Césaire's Discourse on Colonialism, most famously, where they're both talking about, where Césaire says, uh, you know, uh, oh, you know, the, the jails are, are, are filled to overflowing, the Gestapo around the corner, oh, don't worry, it's just the Nazis, and they said, yeah, uh, Hitler's the worst person, person on earth, not because of what he did, which was what Europeans have been doing to Africans for decades or hundreds of years, but if, for who he did it to. Um, and Du Bois in the world in Africa makes that clear as well, that it was the loss of the African colonies uh, that turned Hitler to the desire to colonize, you know, just treat Ukraine as a colony. So you have the, you have, you, when you have these shifts from, uh, from, uh, self-described liberal democratic states to politicians who openly and explicitly are like, let's do the exception thing and take that as the standard practice and who we are, which Mr. Trump was doing. He, he was like, no, we're not, we should seize the oil in Iraq. <laughs> you know, let's not pretend that we're going there to help them, let's seize the oil. And that's exactly the shift that Hitler makes when he's like, no, we're not colonizing for the benefit of other people, we're colonizing to enslave. And so when you allow those practices, when you allow a robust practice like U.S. mass incarceration directed against one group, um, you know, you're just leaving something on the table to, uh, and in your book you're focusing uh, mostly, mostly, but on both, on U.S. mass incarceration and the response to black protests, um, on these exception moments. And then you're saying, and what Trump does is exactly what Du Bois is describing in the world in Africa, and Cesare is describing. Like, of course, somebody's going to come and say, "Look, this is who we are." Huh. Right, right. So, I'm, I'm glad you brought up mass incarceration because um, there was a. So you have a fascinating discussion of it uh, in the book. Uh, it's around page 117. Um, what example I remember? And yeah, yeah, but and and what you show in the book is the way in which I take it these logics, the logics of fascism, kind of grease the skids for punitive practices. Yeah, right. And so it's because it's because of these logics, it's because of the us and them, and the demonization of the them, and then the, the them becoming kind of super predators, juvenile super predators in the nineties, etc. That you have this shift that, it, that 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 mass incarceration is allowed to to happen, right? And there's no empathy. So so that's uh, that's 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 so that's very interesting because in in part it's connecting the logic to the actual practices and how they how they happen. Um, I, I, I'm particularly glad you you're bringing up mass incarceration because that's the one space. That is one space, maybe not the one space, but one space for sure, where any time I'm in it, I mean, any time I'm at Rikers or at any prison in this country, uh, or, well, the prisons in France aren't that different, but for sure in, in the United States, any time I'm in the carceral context, I feel as if we are living in a fascist state. Right. right. You know, so, so that's actually a, a space where, now, you don't <coughs> feel that you're living in a fascist state 
so much in other spaces. You, you don't feel it on 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 a on a, on, on a campus, on a higher education campus, or walking through the streets. But when you're in uh, a jail today, or when you're in a courtroom today, uh, and you see the way in which kind of um, young men of color have been just kind of funneled into this system, and that it's that it's a system that's almost been built for them, and of course, and for uh, young women of color and um, and others and and and, and, uh, and young Hispanics and, and of course uh, throughout America I mean there's uh, also an enormous number of uh, poor uh, persons of, of all ethnic backgrounds uh, in prison and the way in which it's kind of dedicated for poor people right. Um, and, and, and going into a courtroom and seeing an arraignment where you just have a line of young men, predominantly of color, shackled to each other and just like all just all just getting sent to jail. It's just and, and you, when you're there, it's just like, no, this this is a this is a police state, this is a this, uh, uh, this is a fascist state. And, it, and almost it's, it's been created for uh, persons of color. So, so both of our books, what both of us are saying is we're, we're saying, look at these incredibly fascist uh, sectors of society. Like you're looking at, the, at both the war on terror and mass incarceration together. I'm focusing more on mass incarceration. And how do you keep it, how do you justify keeping it like bottled up? And indeed, that's Du Bois's point in The World in Africa, that's Césaire's point in Discourse on Colonialism, when there's no justification anymore for the system as you've set it up, that anti-democratic subsystem that's directed against certain people. When there's no justification for it anymore, then it just becomes this thing that, you know, then, then you get someone coming and saying, no, there doesn't need to be a justification. It's all about who's in power and who's out of power. And if you look at, you know, if you look at what, what uh, Hitler says about colonies, when you look at, uh, and you, you know, you, you can't possibly justify our system of mass incarceration, so, uh, or the Iraq war for that matter. Mm -hmm. And so both of them, and of course Trump cuts, cuts his teeth on, you know, in the Central Park Five case. Right. He's somebody who learned his rhetoric uh, during the late 80s, early 90s. Right. Um, so, so those systems, when you, when, when you have systems Anti clearly anti-democratic systems that have no justification other than power, then someone is going to come and say, yeah, it's about power. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know. right. But I mean, so, but, but, but what I'm trying to understand is, so in other words, I, I'm, I'm using, these, using these examples, you're using um, examples of things that I would call, say, uh, a counterinsurgency practice. Right. Uh, and the fact that they are instantiated today. So there's, in addition to the rhetoric and the logic, right. right? The fact that they are actually instantiated today. So, right. The use of torture abroad, or the use of a paramilitary uh, policing uh, at protests in Ferguson, or the, the, the excessive militarization of policing. Right. Those are practices that I can then say, this is a counterinsurgency mode of governing that we have today. But the open militarization is a core part of sort of fascist self-presentation. Yes, right. But you see, I, I'm not sure that I would be prepared to say we live in a fascist state in the same way in which I would be prepared to say we live in a counter-revolution. Now, and so this is these are right differences. No, no. I, I wouldn't say. I also would say it's not clear what a fact. Stanley Payne. If you look at the literature, there's a large sprawling literature on sort of what is fascism, what is, and everyone is very. And there's lots of conflicts and and. But I think everyone is in agreement that states that label themselves. I mean, my model of fascism. I mean, I take the United States to be, uh, you know, uh, in the uh, to be have. You know, in the 20s and 30s, not to be a fascist state, but a strong fascist inclinations. Uh, du Bois, in the beginning of Black Reconstruction, I don't have this quote in my book, but he's like, uh, he says, uh, 
he says, uh, the world, you know, the wor I forget what, it's towards the beginning of Black Reconstruction, he says, you know, everything was wonderful, it was in Eden, and God created this Eden, and then he threw a black man in the mist and fascism erupted. You know, so it wasn't foreign to black American intellectuals in the 1930s to use this vocabulary. Um, so, uh, but that's not to say, what do you say about states where the, so in the fascism literature, you have people saying, look, um, so the term fascism specifically is a very specific term that, you know, if you want to use it anchored just to Italy, you can do that. But then, you know, Germany is going to be very different from Italy. And so if you want some, what I'm seeking for, what I'm looking for is some larger, large, is some way of, uh, some term that fits, not alt-right, because you should not use the words that the people tell you to use <laughs> to mask what they're doing. <laughs> uh, it's not a grunge band. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so I'm looking for a term that would cover very, very different states. Like, you know, you had Germany and Italy, there, Germany, you had much more of, of, of a sense where it was, corporatism was much less of a thing in Nazi Germany. It was more like, you CEOs, you run your, you run your organizations like you want, and we'll leave you alone, and you leave the government up to us. Mm -hmm. um, Italy was much more, Italy had a very different sort of relationship of governments to private industry. So when you talk about a fascist state, it isn't super clear that any one economic structure emerged mm -hmm. to define a fascist state. Mm -hmm. um, but nevertheless, you have uh, ultranationalism, <coughs> patriarchy, uh, a power, strong distinction between in-groups and out-groups, uh, an enemy in the way that you describe state. You have anti-democratic, like Hitler says, you know, in his speech to the industrialists in 1932, the Düsseldorf industrialists, um, he says, uh, you know, people say democracy is effective, but like, look at the military, that's the most successful thing, and it's not democratic, you know, it doesn't run, so. Right, 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 right. So it's fair to say then that it's, it's kind of, you're, you're trying to extract the essence of fascism and describing our tendencies that have that, that character and essence today. And the practices, the pro I mean, fascism, yes, and, 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 and the practices that, that are sort of typical and the institutions that, that get placed at its center, like the military, um, uh, and practices like, practices that construct hierarchy in the way that you describe torture as constructing hierarchy, and certain practices of incarceration as, as constructing hierarchies. Right. Whereas democracy is about equality, is about voice, everyone gets a voice. Right. Um, right. It's not about top-down, it's not, it doesn't prize as, you, both of us use the same vocabulary, both of us talk about how winning power, masculinity is, you, you're focusing on counter-revolutionary practices. So our focuses are somewhat different. Mm -hmm. You're saying, look at all these weird practices that are just spreading more and more. Hypermilitarization, um, uh, the treatment of a whole segment of a population like it should be treated with, like in these incredibly brutal ways that you would never treat people who are not in that population, mm -hmm. often with no justification. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I wonder what the, so I wonder what the colonial uh, dimension is because, um, Somehow, I think that the, 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 the genealogies that I trace are more connected to the colonial uh, and imperialist uh, dimensions of, of those practices yeah. than to the prototypical kind of early fascist uh, expressions. Well, I mean... Uh, I, I mean, I, 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 no, I don't, I mean, this is, I mean, this is why Du Bois is, people don't really read the world in Africa, they read Césaire in its place, but Du Bois is more of a historian than Césaire, and he very clearly lays out Hitler's obsession with the loss of Afri German African colonies. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, Hitler, Timothy Snyder in Black Earth, Holocaust is History and Warning, uh, talks at length about this. Um, uh, the Hitler in the first chapter, Hitler's World, um, 
uh, he's obsessed with uh, with uh, colonization. Uh, Ukraine was going to be, you know, he he the model for Ukraine was going to be the Confederate antebellum South, uh, where Ukrainians would be enslaved, Slavs would be enslaved to German, large German plantations. So it was like this mixture of the Confederate South and. So it was very, and look at Césaire, the discourse on colonialism. <laughs> That's it. He's saying Nazism comes out of colonial, European colonialism. Mm -hmm. And that's what Du Bois is saying too. And, and Arendt, what's part two of Origins of, of Totalitarianism called? Mm -hmm. Imperialism. Right. Uh -huh. right. So, so right. at the core of, so your book is about, it's when you have these practices that are meant to establish colonialism and imperialism, and to create the hierarchies and, uh, and solidify them. They start out with this sort of racial contract mills type justification of, well, we're doing it for your own good. Mm -hmm. um, but then they immediately transform mm -hmm. into, hey, well, that's obviously not for their good. Let's, let's just take the oil. Mm -hmm. And so I think we are reinscribing the past and the, liter the post-1945 literature is very clear. Arendt, that's what one-third of origins of totalitarianism is about imperialism. Right, 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 right. But the difference, if there is one, is something about a, a population, an ex the, the externality of the population that's being governed, which under counterinsurgency theory then um, kind of creates this way of imagining a total population is divided in, into these different sectors, right? The, the, the insurgents, the passive masses, which is a different imaginary, I think, than the, uh, the fascist imaginary of one's own population because you're, because you're in it. And so, and, so, and so you would have a different conception of the Aryan group, perhaps, uh, from, a, from a fascist perspective uh, than you would from a kind of colonialist, um, anti-insurrection anti perspective. So I've worked a lot on the emergency manager law in Michigan, mm -hmm. uh, and Flint, Michigan, mm -hmm. so I've mm -hmm. had pieces in 2014, 2016 about it, and I've argued there that we need to think about the treatment of black Michigan residents in terms of settler colonialism, mm -hmm. poisoning the wells. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the Emergency Manager Act, 51% of black Michigan citizens lived under emergency management at some time between 2008 and 2013. 2% of white Michigan residents lived under emergency management. Clearly, the state of emergency, the state of exception, is just, is just for black Michigan residents. Uh, the, the, you have this, so you have to think in terms of settler colonialism, and you have to think of these practices being used against internal populations. Um, I mean, if you look at, uh, I mean, it's kind of... just kind of close to Chris Hayes' work on uh, a colony and a nation. Yes, right? exactly. Which is the, yes. I mean, there the model is really that the yes. form of uh, yeah, the colonialization the has been an internal one to this country. Yes. Um, yes, exactly. And mass and parts, I mean, you know, that's why you move between Ferguson and, and, and uh, colonization. Right. Um, right. Because we're using the military on our own population, uh, mm -hmm. and, and uh, it's racialized, and, mm -hmm. uh, and it's the same structures. Mm -hmm. um, and it's exactly what Césaire says about Hitler. He says, you know, Hitler's the you know Hitler's the worst person on earth, not because of what he did, but because he did it to other white people. Uh, um, you know, you bring it back to your, uh, you bring it back. Those practices get justified externally, and then you have someone saying, well, look, there's no justification for these practices. Look at who we are. That's what Mr. Trump said. He said, we're not good. I quote him from his camp, we're not good. <laughs> Look at who we are. <laughs> like, you know, and, and he's not saying this as a critique. He's saying you shouldn't be good. And that's, that's the, this fascist mentality. Right. And that's, what, that's why the Iraq war prepares you for an anti, explicitly anti-democratic candidate. Um.
but uh, so okay, but then would you be would you be prepared or or, or let's look at the Obama administration for a second, <laughs> then uh, <laughs> because I suppose that is a place where you would have more difficulty mapping maybe I don't know I'll hear in a minute but mapping on kind of fascist logics whereas I would have no difficulty mapping on counter counter revolutionary logics or counterinsurgency theory through you know drone strikes uh, etc and, and continuation of those and and military continued militarization department of defense uh, procurement etc 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 right um, so my previous book how propaganda works was about hypocritical uses of democracy so it's much closer to your book I mean your book is amazing because you clearly expected Hillary Clinton to win and then because it's the, it's the and then it was written right for a right democratic it, party right. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> and, and, and the concern that we were going to continue the right. revolution basically. right it's like continue the hypocritical right. you know lying to ourselves right. and then but so I wrote how propaganda how propaganda works which, uh, unlike how fascism works, does get translated into Turkish and Chinese because it's a you know criticism of liberal democracy and people are like oh yeah great the, uh, the uh, so um, that is about how the the you know the uh, Iraq operation Iraqi freedom the hypocrisy uh, how colonialism involves a logic of masking what you're doing um, so uh, so uh, but what I what I think is that. And, and I think that's, you know, the, we never lived in a democracy with some far off ideal. We lived masking what was going on with these rhetorical mechanisms by naming things a certain way, and by imagining ourselves as spreading democracy, of course, and, uh, and by, by engaging in these uh, uh, fascist ideas, these, these outgroup ideologies that would say, you know, these people are not enemy combatants, they're terrorists, and so we don't have to treat them as equal. Um, but it, it doesn't surprise, so what I was saying in the 2015 book is look at how we're masking this from ourselves by this vocabulary and by this, by this way of making it seem democratically acceptable. But, what, but right now we're masking, becomes, our, what we were masking, was it these fascist tendencies? Yeah. The essences of yeah. fascist tendencies? So, so, so my, how propaganda works, the core case is mass incarceration mm -hmm. for my theory of propaganda. Mm -hmm. And like Naomi Kart Murakawa's work is a big influence on me, like, mm -hmm. like how, you, how you mask, you mask illiberal, pra illiberal, you mask her these horrific practices by by saying, okay, this is law and order and, and, and what's happening is just these people are like less than human and so we need some completely different tactic with them. Um, and you know, you uh, you uh, you treat them you convince yourself that uh, the practices are not horrific because you you have an ideology you have a racist ideology for example. But in going back then to the previous book on propaganda rather than this book on fascism, does that mean that you does that, you you wouldn't be you're you're not prepared to kind of apply this book to uh, 2008 to 2016? Well, I think it's I, I, as I said, I think it's very much like um, I mean. I'm at Yale, so I know there are people who, who were like, yeah, we were spreading democracy. But, uh, you know, I, mean, I guess we did the Iraq war or whatever. I we were on camera, but... Um, so, uh, so uh, but, uh, but it's kind of hard in retrospect to do that, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, so um, but there was this sort of deep way of masking this mm -hmm. for, for, from ourselves. Mm -hmm. But... What we the way I got led to this book, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I, I started writing on Trump. I wrote the first New York Times editorial on Trump in October 2015. It took I wrote it in August 2015. Like he's going to win, and that's it. And I got it published in October finally. Um, but because I was thinking of that transition of like Du Bois's The World in Africa, where he's like starts off talking about 
the World Fair in the 1890s and how the Germans represented science and knowledge and the French represented art and literature. He says, now we see what the Europeans are. You know? <laughs> and so when you have those practices, the practices that you and I talk about, the counterinsurgency practices, the counterinsurgency practices, as you show, depend on this masculinist ideology, this domination. Mm -hmm. They depend on precisely these, and then you mask them from yourselves by saying, okay, these aren't really genuine combatants. Right. They're really some kind of like creature, not really, you know, you don't have to treat them in the same ways. Like real, like Geneva Convention doesn't apply to them because they're terrorists. Right. And so, uh, so, so then what we learn when we look at Césaire, Du Bois, and, the, and Arendt is that that then becomes, you know, that then becomes somebody saying, okay, let's just stop lying to ourselves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes I wonder if the, kind of the difference has to do with scale. Uh, certainly not in the context of mass incarceration, I wouldn't think so, but in terms of something like indefinite detention, mm. right? So one of these practices that counter-insurrectional, it's, it's a pure counter-insurrectional practice, one would think it's also a, a, a practice that could be described through the lens of the fascist logics as well, right? Indefinite detention, surely. Um, but it's applied to a relatively small number of persons, relatively. I mean, you know, like one time ago it was up in the multiple hundreds, now it's less than a hundred. Um, so there's so we have uh, in this country a, a possibility of a mechanism that would surely be um, indefensible. This notion of indefinite detention is completely indefensible under a country that believes in due process of law. I mean, there's no, I, I can't. It's an exception. I mean, it's just, I can't, I can't, you know, I mean, I know it's defended by administrations since. 9-11, but it's indefensible for anyone who believes in the notion of due process of law. Um, but the problem I take it, that, or the, the issue is, is scale. Right? It doesn't mm -hmm. apply to, I mean, if it applied to more people, then we would definitely qualify uh, the situation as something like fascist. Right. 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 So that's, that's what happens. The f fascism happens when the practices that you direct, the anti-democrat, the, those practices that you so ably, amazing, terrifyingly describe in your work, are broadened to everyone. And that's why, you know, Césaire is like, oh, don't worry, you know, it's the Nazis, they'll be gone soon. You know, that's what happens. It gets expected to everyone. You see that a little bit in Eastern Europe. All the, like, the, all the political opponents are, you know, if you're a political opponent, you're, you know, tarred with all the way you're a monster, you're a, uh, you right. know, right. It, it gets brought into political opponents. Right. It gets brought into anyone who's, you know, the enemy. Right, right. And so, and so it's, these, it's these tendencies, it's these ways in which particular mechanisms are developed um, and then exist, um, but, but there's a question of their scale. So, for instance, uh, the drone strike of an American citizen abroad. Right. You know, so that was put into place, legalized uh, under the Obama administration, um, justified. It took a forty-one page memo to justify it, right? But then, but then it's it, it. There's only one case that we know of that was an intentional killing of American abroad. We have you know nine or so others have been. Uh, Killed and through drone attacks, etc. Uh, but somehow, it's the it's there's a relationship of scale that uh, that means that that means that one can that, that means that at least for me, I can I can describe this as a form of governing that is kind of revolutionary and that has a fascist essence. But I wouldn't be prepared to go further than that. Right. The, uh I, I mean, I think what I, I don't I don't think we're disagreeing in that I think but the the danger is 
we both agree there's something really dangerous about allowing these exceptions. <laughs> huh. What happens when you allow, I mean, we don't both think President Obama made a terrible mistake not to like punish people for torture, stop the drone program, and just be like, he made a terrible mistake. And the reason he made a terrible mistake is because he said it's okay to have exceptions. And the problem with exceptions is that, uh, and we see this very clearly with some of the explicit fascists like Hitler's writings, is they look to the exceptions as the place that should then be the general case. Mm -hmm. Like, or Schmidt, as you know, both of us talk about Schmidt. And mm -hmm. I mean, Schmidt is like, you know, this democracy thing is entirely hypocritical because, you know, you can call an exception. So when you allow those moments of exception, uh, you know, and I would look to Michigan as an example. I mean, Michigan is a case where they suspend democracy for a financial emergency. I mean, that's, I mean, incomprehensible, right? Like, you know, uh, so, so we get ourselves used to certain anti-democratic practices. And now you're asking me, okay, when do we live in a fascist state? And, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know when we live in a democratic state. I mean, those are extremes. I'm not even sure there's a, a, a coherent thing of a de fascist state because fascism is so, so often silent in the form of the economy. Um, so, uh, so you do have uh, states that, you know, I mean, Nolta and Three Faces, the Faces of Fascism is describing very different structures there. But both of us agree that there are these pr set of practices, and we're describing the set of practices. And what I think the danger is, is when you tolerate those set of practices, then they're going to, ex well, the danger, the danger, I mean, you know, you shouldn't be allowing those practices anyway <laughs> against the population. But if you're going to convince people that, you know, if you're convinced people who are not in that population that they shouldn't accept them for their own self-interest, you should say, well, eventually it will be used on you. Right. Because, you know, that's the whole point of Pastor and thing. Right. First they came right. to the... Right, right, yeah, yeah. Um, how does this relate to right populism? Um, so this is obviously a question for many of us in the room because we're about to study left populism mm -hmm. and issues of populism. But um, what, um, what I mean, what it, do you, how do you dis, do you, do you distinguish, or do you need to distinguish? And maybe there isn't any. But would you distinguish these fascist essences from what we might call right populism? I mean, many of the strategies of populists are the strategies that you talk about. We the people uh, is a dividing between the us and the them, and, and, um, and many of the, the, the questions of social hierarchy that you discuss, um, even the sexual anxiety is, is common. Um, do, you think it's in, do you think it's important is, to distinguish? Uh, is, it a, is it a wrong use of a category? Uh, right populism, or what do, you, what, what do you think about populism, basically? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, it's, and what do I think of right and left when you think of fascism? Right. And if you look at, like, Father Coughlin, uh, Father Coughlin, I forget which one, how you pronounce it, I mean, in the, in the 30s, he was kind of pro-New Deal for white people. <laughs> he was, like, pro, like, yeah, let's have jobs program, let's have an even more generous job program for white people. But he was very pro-Hitler. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, <laughs> So, so on the, on the other hand, you have clearly, you know, fascist structures that are that just want to have everything be set up like a business. Like, if you look at Brazil right now, um, uh, you know, you've got like this. We're going to privatize everything. Um, so, right and left are complicated dimensions, and I don't sometimes know how to think about them with regard to to this. Um, uh, but, uh, but. Look, there, there's long debates in the sort of um, in, 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 in the literature on fascism and Griffith and uh, and Paine and others uh, on the relationship in like the early 20th century between right authoritarianism and uh, and fasc and the nascent fascist movements that were that were arising. Mm -hmm. I mean, fascism is a very kind of specific construct based on a specific version of hypernationalism that uh, can take the, you know, in, I would say in, in the American South probably takes the form of, I mean, 
takes the form of white nationalism with the mythic past being the Civil War and, uh, and the antebellum South. Uh, so, uh, so there's a very specific structure. There's a, you know, and, and if you want to get, get into the philosophy, the right Hegelianism and Giovanni Gentile, and, you know, uh, it's about the nation, you know, mm -hmm. and the nation being the central, the nation versus the state. Mm -hmm. and, and the nation, uh, I mean, we get a lot of that vocabulary now um, about the nation, uh, but, you know, they deny they really mean it. But, uh, but, you know, the nation gets reified, and it's not mere nationalism, it's a certain form of nationalism uh, based on a common ancestry, common, uh, and, there's a social, and, and there's a social Darwinism involved in it that isn't involved in all kinds of, like, conservative, conserv right-wing conservatism would say, tradition is good, it has its own value. That's not what's going on in fascism. It's much more social Darwinist. It's like, um, like the reading we read, Guillaume Fay, in your, in, for the Cox's 13. Yeah, he says, he sets up this crisis. There's a crisis coming. Mm -hmm. The crisis is going to be environmental, it's going to be multifaceted, and we need to, we're only going to survive it as a French nation. Mm -hmm. and as a European nation, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and so we just have to pretend that we are one nation with one background to die, so we don't care when other, other groups die. Mm -hmm. And Hitler was the same thing. He said, this is going to be a food crisis. And so we just have to, like, win this. The Aryans must survive. And so there's this social Darwinist aspect where, uh, which is very different from just saying, okay, our traditions are valuable. It sounds, though, as if some critics of populism, like John Morgan Miller or others, use the term almost in the way kind of you use the term fascism to diagnose our contemporary situation. No, because they, they always want to accuse, they always want to include um, I mean, I think Jan Werner Muller, I, you know, I'm highly critical of Yasha Munk and Jan Werner Muller because I don't think, uh, I mean, we can go through the details of their positions. I mean, Munk argues that populism is a worrisome thing and populism is when someone claims to speak for the people. But, you know, what if they are speaking for the people? <laughs> what if they're right? <laughs> you know, like, wait, 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 wait. like, what if they're right that the elites are screwed up? <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, that's, you know, uh, the uh, the uh, you know I don't I think Jan Ber they want I think there's a very different sort of structure there, there's different but I do think that there's there's bad forms that don't fit what I'm saying I mean you know I have a lot of complaints about you know I think Cuba is an authoritarian society I mean they have a good healthcare system or whatever, but, you know, China is an authoritarian society. Uh, I mean, it's tricky here. Uh, I mean, and the rhetoric doesn't fit this. It's not supposed to be based on nationalism. Mm -hmm. Of course, whenever you do find, I mean, Nolte makes this point about Stalinism. He says it really ended up being fascism because Russian nationalism took over. There were ethnic genocides. But there are authoritarian structures that don't look fascist at all. And there are po populist, there's populist rhetoric. You know, when you vilify the banks, you know, when you vilify the rich, you know, uh, that doesn't look anything like the structure I'm describing there. Right, so there might be some places where there are actual distinctions. Shabbat, for instance. Okay, and also the question of, yeah, the relationship, say, to governing structures. Uh, uh, in other words, the a, a fascist imaginary would not have the same kind of critique of a governing elite, say, um, as the populist imaginary. But sometimes, and so sometimes one might be able to kind of actually draw a distinction. Well, fascists say, do talk, do attack elites always. Um, but because cosmopolitan elites, elites, is it possibly different elites in some way? Um, uh, which is the whole problem of uh, populism in power versus populism outside. The, the yellow vests are posing a real issue here. I don't know if ever, because yeah, yeah, no, no one knows whether they're left. And it turns out, I, I saw the other day, there was a pitched battle between the 
left yellow vests and the right wing yellow vests and the far right yellow vests. Mm -hmm. So the yellow vest movement, and uh, Didier Arbonne has written about this too, about how working class communist uh, 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 French people voted for Le Pen. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. uh, so there's this, uh, you know, there are times when you know, the elites screw up so badly <laughs> and everybody's angry at them. <laughs> and so, uh, but, uh, but with the yellow vest move movement, you see that there are clearly leftists and there are clearly right wing people, yeah. and they're not ultimately on the same side because yeah. because Although, of yeah yeah yeah. So there there are these moments of tension, and there was this you know this one space where actually the the anti fascist the yellow vest excluded uh, extreme rightist yellow vest from a protest. Right. right. But for a lot of the yellow vests, it's like I'm neither left, I'm neither right. Right, and that's the kind of that's the expression. I mean, but it, but it is a very but it does have a populist feel to sure. it because it is yeah. you know we are we always get the short end of the stick. Well, even and, at even at Occupy, I spent a lot of time in Occupy on the street, and there were some people on Occupy who did not share my ideology. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that was, I mean, that, but, I mean, generally it was people well, who my ideology, but there were some. That's part of it. Definitely there. Yes, that's a new mode Rothschilds. of social <laughs> movements which are open ideologically. Occupy yeah. was open ideologically. Yeah. Some of the posters, some of the some of the slogans, some of the placards that Occupy were very libertarian right libertarian. Yeah. And the and, and the fact that it was legalist and the fact that the yellow vests are legalist means that in some way it has to be open right. ideologically because it's not Making exclusions. There's no one who's policing the borders. No one's saying you can't be a yellow vest. Uh, although uh, there's sometimes there's some limits to that. But I'm wondering if right populism, just to get back to that for a second, and then I want to ask you something else. But I'm wondering if right populism is a term that is being used now rather than fascism because of the blowback that you get, particularly, right? When you use fascism, right. right, and so the critique of it's the normalization of the term, and yeah. now now everybody's fascist. Right, so exactly. Nazis are the same as you know. They're doing the same thing that they do with racism, right? Like right. against me, right. it's fascism. Right, right, right. right. You're right. overusing. Yeah, the term. yeah, yeah, right. So, so I'm wondering whether some people are using right populism as a way to get at the similar kind of tactics and rhetoric and, and logics as you, but yeah. more innocuously, so that we can then call it right populism, which remains problematic, but can be somehow, but we can kind of create an exception for national socialism and you know, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, Mussolini is very different from from National Socialism. Right. I mean, right. you know, right. you know, the core case of fascism did not result in genocide. You know? right. So, right. you know, the Nazis are really bad, but you can uh, Oswald Mosley is not, and you know, didn't promote genocide. So, um, you know, there are plenty of self-described fascists who, uh, uh, but yeah, people are using right populism to term, and I think just populism is kind of a vacuous term. I, I don't see much content to it. Mm -hmm. And so, because everyone creates us-them distinctions. I mean, you know, that's politics. You run against, like, you, you run against the bad guys and, and you attack them as them. And, you know, uh, but when the us-them is based on nationalism, on skin color, on, on this structure, like in the Hindutva movement, where it's like, you know, you know, Hindu nationalism, which was explicitly, you know, involved with national socialism. Uh, the, uh, you know, you have this structure where there's a pure group, mm -hmm. and the pure group is sort of the pure group because of their, their heritage and background, and that's what I want to focus on, and that's what I think the danger is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, if somebody says, the elites in New York City, in the cities have really screwed up, well, I need to listen more to find out if they're right. <laughs> if they're going to say the elites in the cities have really grown and screwed up because they're gay and they're Jewish, and, you know that? No, <laughs> you know, that's a problem. Right. 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 No. Right. But if they, they're going to say, that's curious. right, Maybe. right, exactly, exactly. So, so that's why the populism right. stuff just drives me crazy because it's like it's completely justified in raging against mortgage, mortgage-backed security. Right, right. 
Okay, oh. and we'll 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 continue with populism next Wednesday uh, in the praxis in the praxis context. Um, one of the passages I was I was um, intrigued by around page fifty three fifty four of your text, drawing on the famous uh, nineteen forty seven work by Victor Gunberg. You talk about the importance of impoverishing public discourse, and I was particularly taken by that. Um, so uh, this is this idea. And, and there's this passage from Mein Kampf uh, that you cite to in the context of impoverishing public discourse where it is written, so Hitler is writing, all propaganda should be popular, should be, uh, it should adapt its intellectual level to the receptive ability of the least intellectual of those whom it is desired to address. Thus it must sink its mental elevation deeper in proportion to the number of the mass whom it has to grip. Because on this being so, all effective propaganda must be confined to very few points, which must be brought out in the form of slogans. Right? Okay. Well, there's that slogans part, but I mean, but, but, the, but the idea here is that it has to be kind of um, uh, limited uh, words, impoverished words, uh, etc. And and I follow with the Bannon quote: "We got elected on build the wall and lock her up." Right. Right. So there's that idea of simple slogans, yeah. but there's also the idea of impoverished language. Um, and so that immediately makes me think of Trump's tweets, right? Not necessarily his speeches, which may be written by uh, uh, speech writers, um, but the way he tweets. and. Uh, and it's, it's always this most impoverished language, right? And so I'm wondering, do, I mean, am I just becoming a conspiracy theorist? Or is there something to this? Is there any evidence of a notion, of, an intentional notion of impoverishment of the language? Well, you, I mean, I mean um, uh, remember when Trump said, I like the least educated? Mm -hmm. I like I like the less educated. Mm -hmm. So that is could have come right. I mean, you know, Mr. Trump is not a Nazi, I mean, a Nazi and uh, or anything like that. I'm just saying that. I mean, Mein Kampf contains some propaganda strategies and you know making people ma making people um, you know uh, dumbing down the population, as it were. <laughs> is uh, you know Hitler says that's you know you want to do that the destruction of the public schools in America is a way to enable certain kinds of politics um, and Trump is aware of that mm -hmm. so, so I think in, yeah. in today's discourse there's there's some people think that it's just a reflection of the fact that he, that Trump is not very intelligent or something or yeah. just doesn't have a very good vocabulary um, so the vocabulary point is. I think I told you this earlier. Um, the my, I'm writing a book with David Beaver, a linguist on political speech, and like we have, we, he's a very empirical guy. Uh, we have this piece in the Washington Post called uh, "Donald Trump uses democratic vocabulary, uh, almost never uses democratic vocabulary." We looked at every single speech he gave between 2015 and 2017. Did just a dumb word frequency thing and found that he's like the first candidate in history. Like he doesn't have freedom or liberty or not within his top 1,000 words. The only time he uses justice is like bring him to justice, not like in a democracy. So his speech, people say to me, oh, he's not explicitly anti-democratic. And the way they say Bolsonaro is like, let's go back to the military dictatorship, folks. But, uh, but, if, but he's explicitly non-democratic in his vocabulary choices. Like Bush, Obama, all Reagan, they're always speak. They're always talking about liberty. Like the Republican Party is all about liberty. You know that that's. But Trump actually did not use that vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so on so the way point, to distinguish between speeches that are written for him and his off the cuff kind of. You make uh, a good point. Uh, Those conferences or things like that. You make a good point. I mean, I'm wondering about. We looked at debates. We looked at the Miller Center transcripts. We looked, including the transcripts of the debates. But I think that Steve Miller and Bannon, whoever is writing the speeches, were also not super. Dead. Like tr Trump uses his. I mean, you can check out the piece, uh, and we should update it with speeches since then. But he uses words like uh, like his most commonly used words like China, Mexico, Iran, like enemies. Uh, uh, Trump 
is one of his 20 most used words. <laughs> Donna is also in the top 20 or 25. Um, so, uh, so, but the question is, we, we, I actually had, to, right before I published the book, um, David looked at, at, was looking at the claim of whether Trump's vocabulary is diminished. Mm -hmm. And, and you raise an interesting complication. I don't know if he's looking at speeches written, mm -hmm. written mm -hmm. for him or not. But he said actually Trump uses a lot of big words, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, more so than other candidates. But certainly not in the tweets. Right. Which are tweets are tweets. tweets right. The only I believe the only thing we could truly attribute to Trump. Right. And, and I think that the the, the, vocab the thing about Trump's vocabulary is that he's always. Um, I know we have a couple of this present, but he's, he, he's doing, he, it's not, and this is, this is, this is, you know, like whatever, how propaganda works, it's not how propaganda works about, it. it's not the content of what he's saying, it's, it's the not, what we call in linguistics, not at issue content, like, when, it, like, take the adjectives he used, crooked Hillary, or, uh, those are always negative, they're all negative, like, you're only lying, uh, uh, I forget who was one. Ted, Lion, Ted Cruz, sorry. Those are always negative. Now, the thing about those adjectives is you can't really, if you're having a conversation, if you're like, so one of his tweets was, Crooked Hillary is going to appoint, have um, uh, Elizabeth Warren as her vice presidential candidate, comma, who lied on heritage. Now, if you say no, meaning to deny that Hillary Clinton is crooked, you can't really do that. Because it's not an issue content. You, the claim is about who she's going to serve vice presidential candidate. Right. So, and he always breaks up. He come, he's never speaking in a linear way. The messages are often contained in the relative clauses, in the breaks. Mm -hmm. You know, he's saying something and then he breaks to say something. Mm -hmm. But, like the message, the message is irrelevant. It's all the insults that are flying off. Right. Right. And so that's what's going on rhetorically. So it's like if you if you're debating, it's particularly difficult because if you go back and you're like, no, it's the way you said that that's a problem. Problem, not what you said, which is banal or pointless. Right. Didn't or not. Uh, it's then you'll seem uncooperative. Right. Right. You're right. Like, yeah. 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 Um, okay. Let me um, let me raise one other issue, and then maybe we can open it up for, for a conversation. Um, uh, about uh, states of emergency, emergency powers, um, which has always been, for me, the most worrisome yeah, that's the aspect of what, of what might come. Uh, so it, it does not look as if uh, Trump is going to be calling in a state of emergency with regard to the, the, to the border as a result of actually Republican resistance. So apparently there are 12 senators who, who would not vote block this and whatnot. So, um, although although my concern had always been you know, more of a state of emergency in response to a, a terrorist attack or, or something like that. In, yeah. in this I mean, Timothy Tim Snyder has written about about this extensively about the ice stock fire moment. Right. But right. That, and this is something I was actually going to ask you about, which is a complication in your book. The Trump probably. I mean, no doubt made a terrible error by getting the security services against him. Because your book is all about the security services. Mm -hmm. And now we're at this weird moment where we're all waiting for the security services to save us. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And so, so, uh, yeah. so, yeah. Uh, I, think, I, I mean, my, my interpretation of that is that the, the counter revolution has been so ratcheted up under the Trump administration that. Even what used to be the kind of institutions that were carrying out the uh, strategies of counter-insurrectional theory, uh, total information awareness with the NSA, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, profiling of Muslims, so when the FBI starts uh, interrogating people in Michigan, for instance, you know, 5,000 Muslim uh, interviews, etc. So that, that, uh, that those institutions which were at the cusp of 
kind of implementing policies that were counter-insurrectional, that we've we've gotten past them, right? And that, that they have now kind of Trump. They they did they they're not doing it enough for Trump that he's actually kind of going beyond them and kind of suggesting that somehow they're well locking. I, I, I don't think that's, I disagree with that reading. I think what's going on, I mean, so there's a difference when you have the vote. What's the difference between the moments in a colonial empire when you're justifying fascist practices in a way that masks what you're doing from yourself? <laughs> like, you're like, hey, we have to do this. Like, we're the better people. We're spreading democracy. But you retain the vocabulary. And the moment when you drop the vocabulary, like, no, we're just taking the oil and killing people. Like, I think, I think even though, like, my 2015 book was about the hypocritical use of democratic ideology and masking reality from us, mm -hmm. the vocabulary is really important to keep around. And it's important even when it's being used hypocritically. Because you could, because, for two reasons. One reason is, like, you can use it, like, like Frederick Douglass's What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, again and again, black liberation movements in the United States uh, have used the vocabulary. Said, you guys like this vocabulary, don't you? <laughs> well, you're not really adhering to it. You know? So you can call out hypocrisy if you still have the vocabulary. Very hard to call out hypocrisy with Mr. Trump, because he's not claiming that he's doing anything. He's just, I'm, being, I'm dominating, and I'm winning, and that's what it's about. So well, you can't say you're being hypocritical. And uh, so when you keep these, when you keep the shell, however confused and hypocritical and how the heck could people think you're actually spreading democracy or how the heck do you, can you think torture is at all fits into the state, um, you at least give people, th there's some effectiveness there. And I think that the optimistic way of security services is many people in our security services even though they behave very undemocratically, maybe they're not, when they're confronted with the bare description of domination and, uh, and subordination and you're just about like killing the enemies, are going to recoil from that. Mm -hmm. That's the generous reading. That is a generous reading. <laughs> <laughs> Um, somehow, somehow, it, it seems to me that it has to be the case that Trump just not did not think that they were going to be pliable in the way that he wants to administer. Well, and he made he made one thing about a Reichstag moment is that I'm not seeing how he could do a Reichstag moment because the security services are not on his side. So you yeah. need the security services to do a Reichstag moment. I mean, uh, um, I'm not if you really just seize the executive. That would be there. Yeah, well, if, the law if, if, if the moment arose. Um, but, the other, but the other issue, so the other issue about these um, states of emergency is the way in which they operate. Um, and one of the ways I, I see the counter revolution operating is as, in some way, cannibalizing exceptionalism so that it becomes legal, so that we, we eat yeah. the exception. The law eats the exception, and and we're back at the at the state of uh, the rule of law, basically. Um, uh, so, but I'm wondering if a fascist logic is somewhat different, which is that it uh, it is more willing to uh, endorse, subscribe, yeah. all live under. Uh, what would be an exceptional... It is a state of exception. It is, right. It, that's Schmidt's point. Right. And Schmidt's point is like, democracy is hypocritical because, you know, people are always calling exceptions. <laughs> right. And we live in a country where we make financial exceptions. So... <laughs> right. Uh, right. So, yeah, so how... I mean, uh, by the way, Mr. Trump in his inauguration speech praised financial emergency... I mean, Puerto Rico, obviously, emergency, praised emergency management and... Right. Um, right. But but yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You're absolutely right. It's when you're like the exception is now the rule, as it were. Right. 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 So 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 we would say that kind of um, the the more essential fascist, or the, the 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 closer we get to fascism, the less we they would the state would have a problem with the exception. Whereas 
from this kind of counter-revolutionary perspective, it's to turn the exception into the rule of law, to make it seem legal, right. so that we make exactly. it seem as if it's just a So they're terrorists, and that's democracy. part of it. We have a terrorist, right. uh, uh, we, we, and terrorists just aren't enemy combatants in the way the Geneva Convention means. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's a legal category. So you use, so you use the law as a weapon of war, as mm -hmm. Sarah Kizavlowski yeah. So one could imagine kind of a flip from a counter-revolution that has a flavor of the new right or a flavor of fascism or neo-fascist counter-revolution from a fascist state being that particular juncture right there. Right, when you're, when you're like, let's not be hypocritical, let's not like pretend anymore that, that let's not do these laws to make, you know, uh, Let's not pretend anymore. Mm -hmm. Let's we're not good guys. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that the stuff that you discuss, where you're really trying to sort of fit it into, that's like the colonial moment. We're like, yeah, we're Christianizing the savages. <laughs> you know, that's what we have to be harsh with them. <laughs> you know, and then uh, and then what? You know, exactly the literature, the classic literature on fascism that everyone blames me for like not reiterating. I'm like, I am reiterating it because that's what's happening. You have this colonial moment <laughs> yeah, right. that you describe in your book where you have where the mechanisms of exception, where you put all these sort of legal framework in to make exceptions. And it becomes impossible to do that anymore. You can't lie to yourself anymore. And then you have someone uh, who says, okay, uh, why do we even pretend it's about power and domination? So, so, and then the word, so that's why you shouldn't start with those, codifying those exceptions in the law in the first place. Right, right, right. Okay, that's been really helpful. Yeah. Um, so let me um, open it up to, to questions, and uh, do we, I don't know, did we, we did have a mic? Oh, terrific, great, thanks. Um, so let me see. Do Hi, uh, my name is Sinead. So one of the things that's uh, struck me about this sort of conversation trying to uh, differentiate fascism or maybe Trumpism and right wing populism from the counterinsurgency, counter-revolutionary logic is the role of uh, reason and the sort of derationalizing logic of the counterinsurgency moment where the state of exception for example, at Guantanamo Bay, is follows a certain logic where it's like, look, these terrorists aren't playing by the same rational rules that we are. And I think there are two branches of that, the, the rational reason argument and then also the economic efficiency argument is like pretty strong for the sort of like neoliberal rationalizing uh, logic for, for creating these exceptions. Um, and that can sort of, uh, like you said, sort of be cannibalized or embraced by the rule of law a little more easily because uh, it, it's founded on this principle of like the you know the public good is based on uh, these sorts of efficiencies and, and rationalities that we hold dear, and we have to create states of exception for people who don't play by these rules or who are, who are unrational. Super predators, right? Called. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it's dehumanizing, but it right. also has to do with this idea of like the, the civilized and the uncivilized, or the right. reasonable and the unreasonable. Um, and then something that strikes me about Trumpism, I don't know. I mean, fascism also really does rely on this sort of like we are hyper rational and, and futurist and progressive sort of logic. But but about Trumpism is that it, it's yeah like laid bare that it's about power and domination now that politics doesn't have to be about the sort of uh, elite, reasonable people who have these institutions backing them. It, it can right. just be about, you know, like, we're gonna, you know, stamp you out and it's gonna be right. awesome. Yeah. So anyway, I wanted to yeah. hear your thoughts about the, the role of reason and rationality in mm -hmm. those things. I mean, yes to everything you said. And fascism, fascism is when fascist ideology works by saying you, pretending you were reasonable and rational, but you made these exceptions that were really just showing it was about domination all along. <laughs> so why not just be straightforward about it? <laughs> That's Schmidt, yeah, the state of exceptions, but you know, like, like why have this pretense? 
uh, where, where we, uh, why not just say some are fit to dominate and some should be dominated? Um, and when, and I think historically when you get treatments of groups, um, like we see in the United States with our black, with black American populations, um, that are so, that can't be fit anymore into some kind of, I mean, I think as I document in the book, and piece, uh, 9 percent of the world's prison population is black American. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, 38 million black Americans. <laughs> they, uh, so when you get to that situation, uh, people are so used to it that, that, you know, yeah, then you have some say it's just about power and domination. And, and yeah, this is, now you get back into classic fascism, into, you know, Jewish reason, you know, it's, it's anti-rational, it's about the will, it's about power, it's about action. Um, uh, uh, you, you know, I, I have a lot about this here, like, you know, the idea, democracy is both, democracy involves universal reason and this idea that everyone is capable of universal reason and that's going to rob us of individuality and, uh, and so, you know, uh, look at, you know, do you have that line of thought from the 19th century in Nietzsche, where it's not obviously fascist, but then you have it taken up, uh, and, and it's this glorification, romantic glorification of the will. And so, and you can have very fancy, gussied up ways of doing it, uh, like um, Gen Giovanni Gentile or, or uh, some folkish thinkers, or you can just have sort of more crude ways of thinking of it, like in Hitler, where it's just like, yeah, I mean, but Hitler's right there, it's about action. And reason, you know, reason is some liberal thing. It's some Jewish thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I wonder though, I mean, I, I wonder about this notion of irrationality or irreason or lack of reason. Because um, uh, it strikes me that in so much of the discourse that leads to the creation of internal enemies, uh, it's danger or um, threat, um, and uh, and almost there's almost a calculated nature to that danger. Uh, you know, so I mean, I would want to I would want to explore this question as to whether or not there have been shifts in the ways in which the uh, internal enemy has been created. Uh, from paradigms of reason and, uh, I mean, there's a long literature on reason. Yeah. There's a long <laughs> literature on this because pra- we have to distinguish different conceptions of reason: practical rationality and theoretical rationality. Like it's okay to be instrumentally rational. Right. Like you've got some right. yeah. threats, yeah. you've got to deal with them. Right. right. But I'm thinking more of you know, the ways in which we thought about madness. So I was thinking here of. Foucault's work, The History of Madness, mm-hmm. and, um, and the registers in which those distinctions were made over time, one of which, of course, was reason, and then, and then it becomes more on a medical uh, model. And so I'm wondering if the model now, though, isn't something about um, dangerousness, uh, which, of course, is a, also a concept that goes far back, uh, 19th century psychiatry, but, um, I mean, when Trump talks about uh, the caravan, or when he talks about Muslims, right, uh, I- I'm not sure it's in a register of irrationality, but in, in a register of, you know, of uh, uh, bloodthirst, right, and, uh, so these, and, and, you know, gang members and, and rapists and whatnot. Uh, it's really it does it does really seem to be something about their inherent dangerousness that he plays on, that he wants to play on to kind of characterize them all as what does he call them? Animals, right? I mean that's his term, right? Public so, health. So I talk about this in the How Propaganda Works book. Public health warnings, like you know, you often have this problem. Like here's a public health warning. They're bringing viruses. They're bringing, but it's really undermining public health. Right. Um, right. But yeah, I think it goes back. But I think what you're talking about is this. It you know, it's it's not. I see how you're trying to fit it into some kind of practical rationality, like danger. We have to. Mm-hmm. So it, it's 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 masked that way as public health warning. 
but it's so obviously untethered from reality. Um, and it's so obvious, and, and, but it, it's meant to create panic. And, and what's, the, what's the sense, what's really going on behind this talk? What's the danger? The danger is impurity. Like, that, that's why you focus on the crime of rape, and, because the danger is that they're bringing impurity, and they're going to, you know, uh, they're going to, like, you know, make our pure, good nation impure. And so moral disgust plays... So the feeling of disgust plays a role here. Mm -hmm. um, that's why Trump is always going in lurid detail. I don't want to use Trump as like a... I prefer to use the classic cases, and then you can, people can decide for themselves whether it's applicable now. Mm -hmm. but, um, but you find in classic fascist propaganda, like, uh, like you're always... You do, when the Germans were motivating going into the East, they were always talking about the rape of ethnic Germans. Mm -hmm. So moral disgust and... And, uh, right, right, of course, yeah, yeah, and all the Darwinism that's in there. And, all and the Darwinism, is, and, exactly. Yeah. So, so there's practical rationality, which is part of social Darwinism. Like, you know, uh, you know, we need to dominate, we need to win. So that kind of rationality is okay. But the kind of reason, Kantian reason, that says that all creatures were that underlies liberal democracy, that is not okay. On this way of thinking. Yes, another question. So, thank you. Um, so in your book, uh, How Propaganda Work, you make the distinction between uh, ideology and flawed ideology. Uh, especially flawed ideology are linked with those kind of harmful practices that reflect also someone's identity. And because they are linked with someone's identity, they are especially hard to like, let it go. And then they are... Um, resistant to rational reflection in the light of new evidence. Um, and so when you talk about Trump, like, letting go kind of this hypocrisy, I'm kind of doubtful. Because I think still that a lot of Trump supporters and himself would often use this kind of language like, I'm not racist, but, and then say something extremely racist. Um, so there is still, I think there is still this kind of uh, rationalization. And also like oh, yeah. in this whole discourse of uh, make America great again, therefore promote the worst that America can do, right? right. So there is this... So, so uh, yeah. well, the make America great again, I mean, that's, I think that's ripped off from Hung Hungary's fundamental law. And as I document in the book, it comes out of the prologue to Hungary. You know, this, this constitution will make Hungary, allow the next generation to make Hungary great again. Um, so, and I don't know how much, maybe it wasn't, but, you know, uh, it's over. And it's part of this mythic past thing. But you make a good point, and that's why I don't, that I, I don't, that you make an excellent point. Jennifer Saul has made this point about Trump in her piece, several pieces of hers on racial fig leaves. Like when, when um, oh, she's a philosopher, brilliant philosopher of language at, at Sheffield. Um, she, uh, she says, look, um, and she's taken me to task for this, for exactly as you're saying. She, she said, look, Trump said, you know, they're rape Mexicans, they're rapists, you know, they're gang members, and some, I suppose, are good people. So he adds that qualification, that sort of nod to liberal democracy, <laughs> the, 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 the plausible deniability thing. Um, so he is still engaging in, you know, Bolsonaro, much, much less so. Um, so, uh, so Trump does, uh, that's why I prefer not, you know, he's somewhere, he's still engaging and feel, I think Jenny Saul is absolutely right about this, he does, he does put in the, uh, the qualifications, um, however, uh, but, you know, he's gotten less, he's more and more using the explicit vocabulary of globalist, nationalist, um, you know, he's still doing plausible deniability. Uh, yeah. So when... Uh, but, you know, even the Nazi, Arendt tells us even the Nazis did plausible deniability because what they did is they didn't denounce violence. They just stayed silent on it. Like when their own militias went out and did horrible extrajudicial killings, they just didn't condemn it one way or, another, or the other. Um, so I think it's useful to go back. I mean, I teach, a, I mean, as you can probably see, I teach a lot of Hitler and... Uh, and so it's useful to see that, like, you know, you read the New York Times, like, well, people are too harsh to Hitler, you know, because he did sound quite, you know, he didn't sound, you know, he was somewhere between Bolsonaro and Trump. And, uh, mm -hmm. 
But here's also another thing that I kind of find interesting is that uh, uh, insofar as Trump is so often parroting the new right. Yeah, as right? we established in that. It, it's, it's, um, he's also not um, instructing people on the, that logic so much as uh, expressing it in a way that would be understood if you understood the logic, but not necessarily if you didn't. So right, and that's I mean, what a dog whistle it, is. It, well, <laughs> that's what yeah, right. everyone well, hears it. The, the far right clearly hears his, what yeah, he's saying. Because I want to say he's doing more than dog whistling, but that, that is the idea of dog, dog whistling. whistling. Um, but like he's not explaining, so you know, we, we talked about but this whole idea of kind of anti anti racism or, or that anti racism is racist, which is the which is the central uh, intervention really of the new right is to turn uh, anti racism or kind of multiculturalism into a racist practice. Um, he's not going about explaining that. No, he's playing on it, uh, and and he's playing on it in these moments where anybody who understands that what the new right is trying to do is get rid of anti-racism or multiculturalism right. would understand. Oh well, clearly that that accusation of racism yeah. is this broader theory about the racism of anti-racism. You know, and you you get it if you understand. That's dog whistling. That, I mean, that's. Dog whistling is when you say something that an audience unfamiliar with the ideology will just be like, okay, and the audience familiar with the ideology will fill it in. <laughs> That's, so he's dog whistling, and it doesn't matter. I mean, Jenny Saul has a great paper on dog whistling where, where she says, you know, there's intentional and unintentional dog whistling. People get hung up about whether he's doing it intentionally. It doesn't matter because when you do all the things he's doing, uh, I mean, that was what's bizarre about the State of the Union. He had that horrific caravan spiel and immigrants would come, which was exactly what the Squirrel Hill Killer was saying. <laughs> the Squirrel Hill Killer was obsessed with the caravans <laughs> and the immigration and the, and the Hebrew Aid Society, Immigrant Aid Society, bringing in you know, left-wing Jews pushing for, for uh, lax immigration laws. And then he flips around and... and and does this this homage to the uh, victims and the Squirrel Hill killing? Uh, so that's the plausible deniability thing. How, how can you call me an anti-Semite? Although there comes a point where the dog whistling becomes somewhat more than dog whistling when we've all you know, understood that globalists or you know is a code term for Jews and uh, or for those who play the Jew role, which right. can be played by you know right, 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 yeah. Okay. Um. Sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. Yes, I'm Good evening. Uh, a young Brazilian, and I heard uh, uh, Mr. Stanley, I think you mentioned four times Bolsonaro. Yeah. So I'm really interested about how you both are seeing the new government of Brazil. And I would like to listen about uh, it a little bit. And I have a second question: Is this? Um, uh, I read the, uh, your book, Counter Revolution, and uh, one thing that really um, impressed me, and I was thinking about, is that the U.S. government starts to legalize the torture since the Patriot Act, and then. And the, inter the interesting thing is that I think in the whole Latin America and probably here in USA too, we, uh, the police officers use torture a lot, but not legalized in a legalized way. So, um, and then I remember Foucault saying that you know the the, the legal acts they use the. Um, they work as not as doing, not as saying exactly what is 
must happen or not must happen, but uh, it's like a game that you use, like this take place with it, you know, and no, torture is not uh, permitted, but well, sometimes it's, it happens and we, we're gonna say, then one in a million, we're gonna say, no, you're not, you're not supposed to do it and I will convict you. So I see that the torture um, that has been used like a norming fact using Foucauldian uh, term, but not in a legalized way. So the interesting thing to me is why the US government uh, is legalizing those uh, tortures, uh, considering that in a lot of places in the world they use torture but do not legalize it. So the, the norm is, yeah. is functioning, mm -hmm. but they don't need to legalize it, you know? Mm -hmm. it, it's not my, mm -hmm. my question. Okay, good. You do Bolsonaro, I'll do Foucault. You start with Foucault and I'll follow up with okay. Bolsonaro. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so the, the Foucault had this concept of inégalism that you are probably familiar with that I think uh, is really useful here. Um, which is this idea that uh, um, uh, there we, we, we play at the border I mean so it, it, we play at the border of the law we push we push the, the law is not this thing that exists uh, in some way exterior to our, our our games and our playing and so we're pushing right and what is remarkable about the United States is the way that uh, uh, first, the Bush administration uh, pushed those limits of what would be illegal, right? Making making it legal, but it never was made legal, uh, yeah. except it was it was never made legal in the sense that, I mean, had someone brought it to an international court, or uh, you know. Uh, even a U.S. court under some kind of, you know, if there were uh, foreign torts acts, etc., uh, still remaining, and, and a strong federal bench, it's pretty clear that waterboarding is torture, right? <laughs> I mean, it's classic. It's the classic inquisitorial form of torture. But but somehow yeah. it was, you know, more, you know, the memos turned these forms and practices into legitimate forms somehow or tried to because of playing on necessity, playing on uh, what it is exactly that is torture. It has to be organ failure all of a sudden. Right. Like, you know, it's not, and so and so if it's not organ failure, uh, meaning what, death, uh, then it's not torture, right? And so there was that pushing and then there was the Obama administration that decided that we weren't going to adjudicate in some way, right? Retroactively, we weren't going to prosecute, and as a result, and it's, it's in that way that things get legalized, although, although, although it's not legal, right? But it just gets legalized. It, it, it no longer is in some way exceptional. It becomes, it becomes in that way normalized. And I think that it's those, and, and, uh, and of course, in Foucault, in, in the punitive society, that was most of the work that he was doing was trying to show the ways in which uh, uh, different practices would or would not fall on the side of being enforced right, as a way to uh, uh, exercise relations of power, basically. And I think that's I think we we've seen a classic a classic example of this with with this process which means that essentially we're not really in a state of exception, but in a state of, you know, you could call it a state of non-enforced legalism, right? But or basically it's just, it's just a state of legality, you know, which has been pushed in that way. Yeah. So Bolsonaro, I got um, very involved in Brazil. I was interviewed by Folia to Sao Paulo and o Globo the week before the first round. And then I've just been constantly interacting with journalists there. I was like, one of the journalists was like, my book came out, they translated my book in three weeks and brought it out. And it's had a big, it's, for some, I think my structure, that must very closely map onto Bolsonaro. Uh, 
Um, and Maura Weigel, who's a young Harvard Society of Fellows person, who's done some really important work. On, she's writing a book on the history of political correctness and cultural Marxism. Um, we had uh, coffee yesterday, and she was telling me, oh yeah, so I have a chapter in the book on the attack on universities, on cultural Marxism and gender ideology, and that's apparently been going on in Brazil for decades. Like the explicit, the stuff that you see in Eastern Europe that, say, Masha Gessen writes about with the attack on European University, St. Petersburg, and the attack on Central European University for gender ideology, you know, uh, and cultural Marxism. That's like Brazil, you know, you guys did well. <laughs> You've had that entrenched system of attacking universities and the press for that for a long time. And so, uh, so I think. Um, I think Bolsonaro was like my first interview. I didn't know really much about Bolsonaro, but uh, but it, so they published the O Globo interview. It was published, and they, I didn't mention Bolsonaro, but it just fit. Uh, and then I started reading him, and uh, you know it fits eerily because Bolsonaro. You know, one thing I get uh, people criticizing me is like, well, what about like the parts of fascism? that have a more planned economy. Bolsonaro is such a, you know, hand everything to the private corporations. But, you know, the last chapter in this book talks about how the connection between CEOs, privatization. I mean, you see this with, like, Nick Land and the Dark Enlightenment and the Peter Thiel kind of far-rightness. Um, when Thiel says democracy is and, and freedom are antithetical, which is just something you get right out of uh, fascism, out of fascism, um, so uh, so you get that sort of privatization as the model, you know, because you know uh, you know companies will run everything, and it'll just be powerful people, and then the the country will be run like like a, like a company with like a CEO and its head. So you find the full structure, I think, with Bolsonaro, and uh, and uh, he's backing off a little rhetorically and just denying that he said what he said what he said, but. Um, but it does look very, and he's doing all the gender stuff. He's, uh, you know, rolling back gender protections and the anti-gay stuff he's doing, and that's very textbook and very central to my description of fascism here. Um, so people will be like, "Hey, look, look at this country where Pim Fortuna was. Uh, you know, you ha you have more complexity with the European far right because you have this sort of like." Muslims are anti-gay, so if you really want to like defend defend Dutch culture, you must not allow Muslims in because we're tolerant and they're intolerant. So you have that structure, but Bolsonaro has none of that, and he looks back straight to military dictatorship. He's just like that's when we were great. Good. I think we have two more questions. Maybe we have time for two more. Paul in front. Paul. I wanted to return to kind of the central question of the panel, which is the relationship between counterinsurgency and fascism. Right. Um, and I, I wanted to propose, just put on the table and uh, see what you two think, um, the idea that uh, perhaps um, counterinsurgency is to fascism as the so-called intelligence community is to Trump. Uh, I see counterinsurgency as very bureaucratic, um, hierarchical, um, about uh, changing incentive structures for populations that you identify as other. Um, and I see... Trump and, and kind of fascism as it's come across today is just sort of a raw projection of, of naked violence, not even mm -hmm. attempting to frame it as you know, in a sophisticated right. pursuit of the national interest. So, I, I mean, that to me seems kind of like a tension. That, that has, I think, come out. I think, yeah, that's, I think yeah. that's been, I think there's been some resonance of that in our conversation. Yeah. I think that's the moment, I think that might be what uh, Jason was referring to that moment where kind of the the veil comes off, the gloves come right. off, or something. Exactly. And we flip from one model to the other. Right. Um, now, so so that that might be one way to think about it. Um, um, I I would continue to push push at some of the edges of that. I think because. Because the, the kind of the brutality that you're associating with Trump and with fascism here, right, or with the more explicit gloves off aspect, um, does form a part of the counterinsurgency, right? In other words, I mean, the real 
brutality of torture, the use of the use of fear and terror, uh, not only uh, as against the small active minority, but also as a way to instill fear in that passive majority, is is key, is central, right? And you know, we saw it in Algeria, we saw it in Vietnam. I mean, we, but this is it. this is colonialism. I mean, colonialism has a bruta- has an incredible brutality. But it's a brutality masked by Christianity. <laughs> it's a brutality masked by that's the and uh, you know this is this is the whole justification for the extreme. I mean, you know, uh, if you if you think about you know, Belgian Congo or uh, you know uh, what the Germans did in Namibia, mm-hmm. you know that's all done under under the guise of it's good for you or American slavery. <laughs> the uh, or when they, or when people say you know what, you know when people say I've, I've heard people say oh well you know it's good that they're making prisoners work because it gives them a work ethic I'm like but he's serving a sixty year sentence you know uh, so uh, you know there is that uh, you know I that's not incompatible with this like the most brutal the most and then when you have theorists of fascism writing about imperialism. You know, that's what they're talking. They're like, you know, <laughs> it was the most ludicrously horrific practices. And how could people have thought this? Right. Or look at emergency, you know, look at Flint, Michigan. Right. <laughs> but for it to work, for those mechanisms to work, they have to be sufficiently visible. I mean, masked, but sufficiently visible. Right. Right. To actually affect, to actually get people from the passive masses or whatever not to become insurgents. Um, so there's this kind of delicate play right. between the terror has the to be terror, oh, yeah. it has to be there. Right. But on the other hand, uh, there has to be some kind of masking, but it does have to be there. Well, I'm thinking of the masking as it's David Petraeus who has reality masked from him <laughs> because he thinks this is necessary in order to spread. I mean, I don't know who David Petraeus from Adam, but I'm thinking that the people you describe in your book are people who are thinking they're defending democracy. Mm-hmm. And so the, the people they're masking that are, that are being fooled are themselves. Mm-hmm. Some of them. Some of them, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah right. Um, in, in right behind you, two rows back. Thanks so much, Ben. Uh, hi, my name is Miguel. I'm a junior in Columbia College. And uh, it seems to me that um, economic dissatisfaction has helped facilitate fascist ideology. Um, you were talking about Hitler's um, obsession over the loss of uh, Af- African colonies and his desire to start that up again. So. Um, I was wondering if there is an economic downturn in the United States or around the world, if there's a recession in the coming years, how will that affect um, fascist tendencies in the country and how do you think they will be manifested throughout society, especially during a Trump presidency? Thanks. <laughs> I mean, I think we'll both say probably, probably it would it would help. I mean, that's like you know the stuff and stuff we read for thirteen by thirteen. The way in which crisis and emergency and talk of drastic like uh, feeds, uh, you know, not just fascism but also revolutionary change of all kinds. I mean. One way in which fascism differs from conservatism is it's revolutionary. It's intended to be there's a crisis, we've got to do something dramatic back, it's not let's keep things, it's let's radically change things. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it, in, look at Bolsonaro in Brazil. I mean, Bols- Brazil's economy collapsed, didn't collapse, but suffered a very dramatic, severe recession, and that clearly greased the wheels for Bolsonaro. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, Hungary, Poland, you know, uh, I'm, I don't buy the it's all economic argument because, uh, you know, neither in the United States nor in, uh, in elsewhere. I mean, Poland, the civic platform was doing, you know, uh, Poland was doing much better. So, you know, 
and yet they, they voted in law and justice. Uh, the United States, I don't think the economic, um, I mean, it's not like black Americans voted en masse for Trump and they were most hurt by the recession. So, uh, you know, uh, it's clearly not, <laughs> it's like Du Bois's chapter in Black Reconstruction, A Poor White. Um, you know, there's clearly, it's clearly not, you can't boil down the attraction of this politics to, to e economics by no means. Um, uh, because you have to remember that, like, the, uh, you know, in the case of the United States, black Americans hurt by the recession did not become, say, okay, let's, let's, let's be quasi-fascist. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I agree, so I agree entirely that, that crisis moments are, are particularly dangerous in that sense. Um, so the only two things I would add would be, um, one, uh, some questions as to what economic decline would entail for Trump right now. Mm. Um, in other words, if it's associated with, say, his trade war, mm. or um, somehow associated with, with him, uh, that might change the equation somewhat. Have you read mm -hmm. Ari Hoke's Child's? You cite, don't you cite it, Strangers in Our Own Land? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you say you discuss it in your book. Yeah. Um, her diagnosis doesn't provide any evidence that economic decline will hurt people's uh, connection with politics, that, with politicians that are responsible for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, she, you know, she documents how people in Louisiana are just being completely brutalized by these policies. And yet, they double down on them because they're like, we don't want the undeserved. I wonder who's meant by the undeserved, too. And uh, so I think that uh, I, I'm skeptical that material harm, because this is a politics that's not based on material benefits, it's a politics based on identity and resentment, I'm skeptical, and history, I think, is skeptical, mm -hmm. that the supporters will be affected that way. Yeah. And the, the only the only other glimmer of hope, though, would be that um, it could be galvanizing in a way to make people reimagine right. uh, where they are and how they fit and who's yeah. and how they fit with others in terms of uh, the, the consequences of the economic decline. And you know, in part, this is in part this is um, so we're going to be reading Chantal Mouffe's new book uh, for a new. Uh, Po uh, for a left populism on Wednesday, you know, that's her argument somehow that we could bring together all of the people who have been economically harmed um, on the, and including those who have voted in, uh, in kind of extreme right ways kind of thinking that, you know, with, a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with what is effectively a kind of a Bernie Sanders type of politics, right, that tries to reassemble some... Right, I mean, that black reconstruction is written as labor policy. I mean, it's unclear how much is rhetorical and how much is, is meant. Du Bois is saying that this will actually happen, this is actually starting to happen, but it's written as if, I mean, this is why fascists target labor movements so much, because ideally labor movements bring together different people for economic reasons. Right. Um, so... That's why Du Bois says that northern industrialists sided with the South in ending Reconstruction because they saw a labor movement de developing. Of course, the labor labor movements have been terribly racist in the United right. States as well. Right. 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 Um, so I maybe one final quick question from our guest over there. Here, I'll, sorry, Beth. Thanks. Tom. Uh, my name is Giovanni Giorgini. And uh, I have a question for Professor Stanley. Um, I listened to your dialogue, and I happen to be 99% uh, agreed with you uh, about how the elites uh, made big mistakes and uh, so on. I have only one perplexity. It is about the use of the word fascism to describe what is happening in countries like the United States of my country, Italy. 
Uh, because I believe, uh, you mentioned the Italian uh, um, philosopher Giovanni Gentile, so in his entry, Fascism, for the Italian encyclopedia, you can find it there, <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, uh, you know, the enemy of fascism is uh, liberalism. Now, it is a ghastly entry because uh, what uh, Gentile stigmatizes uh, is uh, this uh, abstract puppet, uh, the liberal individual. Yeah. The individual does not exist. What he hates is liberalism, rationality, his abstractions, uh, and free market. And uh, what he proposes in fascism is uh, the ethical state uh, and uh, a notion of the person which is different from the liberal individual. Right, so I discussed I discuss this a little in the book. Yes, Gentile yes. The book. So uh, I don't think, uh, and I believe the same problem is with Carl Schmitt. You know, uh, Carl Schmitt hates liberalism. Right. If, it, if there is one thing we can say about him, eh, was he a Nazi, was he just a yeah. Catholic conservative, he hated liberalism. He thought liberalism is a fraud. Absolutely. So, I believe that in order to understand what uh, Mr. Trump is doing in this country or Matteo Salvini is doing in Italy, I think the notion of populism helps and works better. Because it's a revolt against the elite, a revolt against what the elite so, is, especially in economics. Right, so, so I, I don't think it helps because I think that I'm mad at the elite and I'm not like them, and so I want to distinguish me and Matteo Salvini. Um, so uh, lots of people are mad at the elite for very good reason. So uh, if we talk, so I don't think that the alternative suggestion helps because being mad at the elites is, is, is just good sense. Um, as an elite, I can tell you that. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, but uh, as far as Giovanni Gentile, as far as the things you said about Gentile and Schmidt, absolutely. Fascism is harshly opposed to liberalism, though at one point Gentile does say, Gentile does say that, um, that fascism is the true liberalism. <laughs> so it's kind of weird, they always do that. Um, but <laughs> that fascists are always like confusing like that. Like, um, but, uh, but Gentile, uh, what, what they're opposed to is the idea, so Italy, Italian fascism differs from national socialism in its relation to the free market. So, so you, we can either like make Gentile definitional of fascism and then I agree fascism is in, because Gentile is weird. And so, and, and, and Italian fascism is its own thing. Um, so you can either say, okay, fascism is only, we're going to reserve it just for whatever happened in Italy. Um, or you can be more general and you can have something, there's an ideology that both Germany and Italy shared, even though Italy had a much, much more government control over the economy, whereas, Ger whereas Hitler was much more, okay, much more like Putin. He was like, you oligarchs do what you want. You run your companies like you want. The free market is good because there's winners and losers. And uh, you know Hitler wasn't like that, so that's a difference between Italy and Germany. Um, the commonality between the two, and the one I take to be definitional of how I use the term fascism, is the anti-liberalism. But the liberalism here is not economic liberalism, because economic liberalism, as I say in my book, is the Manhattan dinner party face of social Darwinism. Uh, it, it's it's the liberalism, the liberalism that erases nations and makes everyone the same because they all have the same capacity for reason. That's what they hate. That's what they hate. It's the liberalism that's based on Kantian reason. The idea that all human beings have this capacity for reason and that, as Hitler says, you know, it erases individuality. Individuality only arises when some people are allowed to dominate others. And in this speech he gives to the industrialists, he's speaking to CEOs, he says, this is the free market. It allows individuality. Some people win, others lose. And this is the justification of the Nazi T4 program. So yeah, n fascism of all sorts is harshly anti-liberal. But I actually think it confuses matters to talk about liberalism in terms of free markets because Hitler has an entirely different relation to free markets. He doesn't read them like Adam Smith does. Um, so, uh, so, so yeah, so I'm, I'm going to stick with my term fascism, but say, let's not give it to Giovanni Gentile. And yeah, G Gentile is weird in like half a dozen ways. 
that would make it just very local to that. Great, good. And so, um, and that raises other fascinating questions about the relationship between all of these forms and, and, uh, and neoliberal ideology. Absolutely. We'll have to, maybe we'll have to do another uh, yeah. chat. You, that, this that. is what's going on in the, with the Dark Enlightenment. There's an entire anti-democratic movement, fascist movement, based on capitalism and democracy are incompatible. True freedom only comes with capitalism. C-standing, C, C you know, the, the rich people will have their independent homes and everyone else will die. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Well, listen, <laughs> uh, what, a, what a future. Um, all right, I was hoping to end on a silver lining or, or some kind of more hopeful, but uh, sorry, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't muster it. Um, well. All right, except all of you, uh, that uh, gives me hope. Uh, yeah for the future. Well, times of crisis can bring exactly. uh, dr dr drastic change in the right direction. It can exactly. make us recognize that we shouldn't be engaging in these tactics because mm -hmm. their masks can be ripped off immediately. Right, right, yeah. exactly. Okay, that's a better place to end then. All right, so join me in thanking Jason Stanley for coming. Thank you. thank you all for joining us. Um, I hope you'll continue with the conversation on next Wednesday on left populism, uh, and that's going to be at the Law Annex.